Now, uh, that was the Minister of Power, and uh, we have uh, two guests joining us to discuss uh, this uh, particular topic. We have Idowu Oyebanjo, MD, Edfong Power Engineering Consultants Limited, and uh, we also have Nicholas Agule, Strategy Consultant, joining us uh, on the show this evening. Thank you so much, gentlemen, and welcome to the conversation. Thank you. Uh, good evening to our viewers. All right, so let me begin with you, Ido. Now, the last time, you know, we interviewed you uh, on the news, we didn't preempt a third collapse so soon. Uh, you know, that would make it the eighth time, you know, this year with the latest incident occurring on Saturday. Now, NERC blamed it on an explosion. What can you say as to the causes of these recurring collapses, uh, Mr. Oibanjo? The causes uh, that, that we have, the reasons for grid collapse, that has been persistent in Nigeria is because of a number of things. One of them is the misalignment in our generation capacity in Nigeria. If you have the first slide that I sent uh, available, there you can display it. You will see that Nigeria has a total installed generation capacity of 8,500 megawatts. And the maximum possible transmission capacity, uh, firm capacity we call it, is 5,500. So there is a gap of 8,000 that cannot be wheeled through the transmission system. Mm. Worse still, the distribution network, because of various factors, including the lack of finance, lack of metering, can only take 3,500 megawatts. So look at these three figures. Somebody has 13,500 megawatts. The transmission can only do 5,500 effectively. And then the distribution can do only 3,500. So this kind of generation capacity, not enough for the uh, grid and the people, Nigerian uh, consumers, make our grid grid a very weak grid that any small disturbance any small perturbation will cause that grid to collapse no. that's number but, one okay but, but, but before then before you go ahead uh, did you hear what the minister actually said uh you know we keep saying that we have we've had eight collapses this year you know and three in one week uh, but in the interview he did say that uh, one of them wasn't actually a collapse but a trip off and power was restored two hours after. Okay, I didn't, uh, I don't know when this interview was done. Yeah, but, 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 but think... can, can that also be said to be a partial collapse? Yes, we have partial collapses where uh, after a grid collapse, you are trying to restore the grid and then something happens again. It may be a misalignment somewhere, it may be another fault somewhere, it may be a mistake by the people trying to restore and then the grid will collapse again so we call that one partial collapse so when people are trying to count grid collapse the event of grid collapses in nigeria they have to be careful that they don't count the ones that are called partial collapses okay. but yeah so uh, i've just given you one reason why you have grid collapse okay. another important reason which was which is the one that happened on saturday the third the one you called the third grid collapse is protection. The Nigerian power system lacks protection. It doesn't have adequate protection systems that are well coordinated and it will continue to trip around 5,800, 6,000 megawatts. You are going to witness a lot of tripping and grid collapse. Why? What happened there was a bus bar fault, as we will call it. There was a current transformer that blew up. Yes, the current transformer blew up but in proper coordi properly coordinated protection system only one bus bar will be affected the remainder will never be affected if that prop system was properly designed and the protection settings have been properly implemented now this situation exists in very many places in nigerian power sector and if this is not fixed i'm afraid we are bound to see increased number of grid collapses in the next few months
Okay. That's another one. Uh, uh, all right. Now, uh, let, let's uh, speak with uh, Mr. Nicholas. Now, uh, we're still looking at uh, some of the factors that actually cause these grid collapses. And, uh, you know, uh, being a data, uh, a data analyst, uh, data shows that Nigeria's power sector loses around 1.5 trillion naira annually due to, you know, inefficiencies. How can data ana analytics, you know, help address these losses? Thank you very much. Uh, before I answer your question about how data analytics will help in the collections, I would like to say that I watched Nigeria's Minister for Power more or less joyfully announcing to the whole world that Nigeria has achieved 5,000 megawatts of electricity supply. And it's painful to watch really painful to watch. What I mean that is that that is electricity for Qatar, a nation of 2.8 million people. They are on 5,000 megawatts. Actually, Qatar is on 8,000 megawatts for 3 million people, mark maximum. And we look at South Africa, they have 65 million people. They are on 55,000 megawatts. If you look at Brazil, that has an equivalent population like us, 200 million plus people, they are on 150,000 megawatts. So we have a minister who is talking about 5,000 megawatts. But, but, but did he say 5,000 or 3,000 to 4,000? Because he did say that. No, he, he, he gleefully, he gleefully and joyfully with with all pomp and pageantry announced that president tinubu's government's plan or objective or target is to reach 6000 megawatts by the, by end, the end of, of 2024 yeah and he he so joyfully was proclaiming to the whole world that as we speak they are they've done 5000 megawatts and in fact he said look at peak period, we have even done 5,400 megawatts. And, and it, it, I don't want to say it's shameful, because as a nation, we shouldn't put shame on ourselves. But our public officials should try to at least put things in the right perspective. You cannot come and be talking about you supplying electricity that in other places will be electricity for a city, just a city or an industrial park. And you say you're supplying that to 200 million people, and it becomes an achievement that you should be talking about. I think if the Minister for Power and his boss, our president, understand the poverty, the energy poverty in Nigeria, by taking a look at a country like Brazil and say, look, they have the same population and a similar population like ours, they are on 150,000 megawatts. How can we be on 5,000 megawatts? It, it means our economy is dead on arrival. There is nothing the central bank can do with uh, monetary policy. There's nothing the government can do with fiscal policy. Absolutely nothing is going to happen if in a 21st century modern day economy, you are supplying it with so little power. That means the economy is not energized. You are like dropping a half a liter of, 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 of fuel in a car and you want to drive that car from Lagos to Abuja. The car is not going to get you there. And this is what these people are now understanding about power supply and the importance to our economy. You know, so uh, if we come, uh, if I come to your, your strict question to say, how do we use data to, to, to make collections uh, better? Because in, in the power sector, you have what you call aggregate, technical, commercial, and collection losses. What that means is that, just like my colleague said, if you generate power and you transmit that power, let's say uh, we generate power in a bin, at the thermal station in a bin there in Lagos, and we want to move that power to Abuja, where it will be consumed, that is transmission. So we use the transmission lines to bring the power from the point of generation to the point of consumption. Immediately that power lands in Abuja, some parts of the power is going to be lost. There's no two way about it mm -hmm. because of that distance. Those are technical losses. Then of course, uh, when you bring the power to Abuja, 
you hand over the power to Abuja uh, Disco. Abuja Disco will then distribute the power. And you, there you say that, okay, if they buy the power at so so rate, they have to sell it to make a profit. And you can have commercial losses from there. And then collection losses is that now that you have sold the power, the people you sold the power to, are they paying for the power? And that is where you are going to have your collection losses. Now, these losses are all the way on that value chain. But you know what? People talk about this uh, lack of payment for power by consumers. And I keep always referring them to the fact that it is the incapacity of the distribution companies that is leading to that. Because if you go elsewhere in the world, you discover that power distribution, especially in cities, like Lagos, Ibadan, Abuja, Bini, and Kano, and all of that. Oh. It's never done with overhead cables. It's all done with underground cables. And these cables are buried so deep in the ground that it is impossible for anybody to go and tap that power and use the power without paying. So okay. if the discos had the financial, technical, managerial expertise and capacity, they could be investing money you know, taking power lines from uh, uh, overhead, burying them on the ground, metering them accurately, so that every single kilowatt hour of power that is consumed will be paid for. Because I can assure you, let me assure you, if you go to the, the United oh, States, okay. or you well, go well, just to... before just before you go ahead, uh, Nicholas, uh, let's hear what uh, Idowu has to say concerning some of the things that you've actually mentioned. And you talked about at first, you know how shameful it is that uh, the Minister of uh, Power is uh, announcing uh, 5,000 megawatts uh, and also 6,000 by years. And when compared to other countries, you know, they're generating a lot more. And then uh, the fact that uh, most of the grid collapses uh, is attributed to the incapacity of the discos. Now, considering that these, uh, you know, uh, the energy sector, that there's talks about it, uh, you know, being privatized in the near future. Now, uh, Ido, I would actually love to hear uh, your thoughts on everything that he has actually said and if privatization is the way forward. Yeah, just, just before he says something, the, the, the grid collapses uh, as a result of incapacity in the transmission and the discourse, both okay. of them. All right. Concrete. All right. Noted. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, over to you, Naido. Yeah, he made. Very, very uh, great submissions, uh, important observations that are valid. Uh, and uh, uh, we can look at how data analytics, which was the main thing for him, uh, can help. One, the system needs what we call supervisory control and data acquisition, SCADA. The system needs what you call centralized data management system. There is no data in the Nigerian power uh, system. And you know data is life. You can't have a functioning power system without data. So this is another way, another area of uh, the expertise of uh, Mr. Nicholas can be very useful. The meters he talked about, very, very germane information. Without metering, adequate metering, you cannot be blaming people, you cannot be doing estimated billing. The minister said it's fraudulent. Yes, the minister is correct to say that. So in meter, you will do what we call meter data management systems. All of these things we have designed, we have advised, we have provided, we have documented how to go about it to those who are in charge of the Nigerian power system. But one of them that is so critical, which you mentioned, is the Electricity Act. I believe that was what you were alluding to. Electricity Act 2023 as amended mm -hmm. is one of the only ways by which we can resolve this problem. And Mr. Nicholas alluded to it when he said, things about transmitting things from Lagos to Abuja. That's quite a long distance. It's lossy. So instead of that, you decentralize the network, make use of renewables, let every state have their electricity uh, market their because the, the country has uh, decentralized and given them the opportunity to do so. Yeah, go ahead. Darren. No, 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 please go ahead. I was just okay, so yeah. by following the Electricity Act, if you see the countries, the states that have done it, let me just tell you the truth. Enugu, brilliant, you know, Abia, you know, Ekiti, Ondo, Oyo, Anedo. You see, 
All these other states that have not done this thing, they are showing us that really they don't like the economic development of their state. Now, during this grid collapse, let me shock. Now, it's not, it's not to shock you, it's just to let you know. Do you know that Aqua Ibo, because they have their own equivalent of what we are asking people to do in, in the Electricity Act, when this grid collapse happened, they were not affected. That's what will happen when you have that about geometric power operational now. Whenever there is grid collapse, it will not touch any state that their governor has put the Electricity Act in place. Talk to your governor. Talk to your governor. Your governor is the person you should challenge why the Electricity Act has not been implemented in your state. The grid collapse that happened this week, Ibom Power, those parts of Aqua Ibom State mm. supplied by Ibom Power, they were never affected. And that is what will happen when this Electricity Act is properly implemented. The final thing that is so critical is the National Independent uh, System Operator. This is also a follow-up to what the Electricity Act Electricity Act requires. It says that a national, uh, a Nigerian independent system operator shall be established before the end of August 31, 2024. We are now in October. I know there is an uh, ongoing attempt that have been made to put the NISO in place. But let me tell you the truth. If these people don't allow meritocracy, if they go and put quota system, if they go and put, I know you, me, I know you, I, I, I better pass my neighbor to put people there, they will just get a collapsed power system like we are having. What you are seeing on screen is to show that we have a misalignment of uh, power. But going back to this uh, independent system operator, they should put the people who are qualified there, people who know their onions, people who know what they are doing. So, so that, that, we that was get... the reason why I asked about, uh, you know, privatization, you know, even at that, people, uh, you know, who, are, who, who have merits should be the ones, you know, to be put there, you know, even if it wants to be privatized. Yeah, that's what happened. The privatization was a shampoo. That's why we are having this problem. So you can see in power system, any error you commit by quota system or any error you commit by putting the wrong people there, it will take you like 20 years to correct the problem. Look at 2013. We are still battling with the error. What did they do wrong? They went to give the thing to people who are not, Nicholas mentioned this, financially and technically competent. So we are in a fix. So when you want to do this nice don't ever put people who don't have experience of power systems, people who don't know the subject matter. Don't even let the people who don't know the subject matter be the ones to select the people. If you are looking for the people who select the team, that would be the first NISO, the first independent system operator. Don't go and give it to your own friends to do. Give it to technically sound people so that they will select the right people. Because... Guess what? The first set of your independent system operator will determine the sustainability of that market. All I will say is let every state go and do the electricity market. Let's have a regional pool of electricity. Let's have regional markets that can support each uh, one another. That way, grid collapse will go down. Apart from the protection I talked about, apart from what, all of these things should be coordinated by the Presidential Tax Force on Power that was supposed to have been established within the first 100 days of the administration of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu. In fact, the policy of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu on power alone is sufficient, is very, very good. Alas, not a single one of them has been implemented. That one is surprising, and that's what needs to be done. If everything in that policy document be implemented, Nigeria okay. will get a lift in power. Oh, but all right. Not one of them. Let, let, let's now hear from Nicholas. Now, uh, in addition to what Idowu has said about, you know, every state uh, being allowed to generate their own electricity, uh, what uh, data-driven solutions can distribution companies implement to improve their operations? Thank you very much. I, before I answer your question, let me say that I totally align with uh, my co-panelist uh, Idowu's uh, position. Uh, we had a transmission network because we were generating power with probably gas in the southern part of the country and with water in Kanji and Shiroro. So we needed to weed that power to the areas where the power was needed. That was what needed transmission. But if we now begin to transition into renewables, then you find out that if you are looking at solar energy, there is the sunshine in every state of the Nigeria. All the 36 states of Nigeria plus the FCT, they have the source of power, they have the sunshine, they have the wind, and they have the water bodies. 
So it is better therefore now that we should start generating power using these renewable sources and supplying it to the to the same places where we are where we are uh, uh, you know generating the power. And perhaps if there's any that is left, that is what we will not talk about injecting it into a national grid. But then we shouldn't have a single system national grid that when a, a leaf uh, is, is burnt on one of the conductors somewhere, it collapses a power supply for the whole nation. You know, so I totally agree with him. Now, in terms of um, how the discourse are going to use data to help them in this process, uh, if the states, as the Electricity Act now has provided, if the subnational government and even the private sector begin to come into the sector, it is not just about domesticating the Electricity Act, but it is about creating the enabling environment to invite investment to come in. And once that investment comes in, we will even have competition. So like the discourse we have now, you can see that the discourse we have now, they're not really doing anything much different from NEPA. Mm. They're not using data. Most of them don't even know how many consumers they have. People are tapping power from them, for which they don't know anything about. They are not able to provide meters because it is, it's, it's, a, it's a meter that provides accurate data of power a, consumption. A lot of other people are still on by... estimated billing. Exactly. So people are on estimated billing, you know. So you know, so they, like like um, my co-panelist said, if they implement SCADA, SCADA will provide them rich data which they can use for planning and all of that. In fact, there is something that will shock Nigerians. Perhaps some Nigerians already know, or most Nigerians already know. Even as miserly and Bengali, these 5,000 megawatts yeah. that the minister is so boastfully speaking about, when that 5,000 megawatts is generated and transmitted and now offered to discourse, that's what the discourse will reject this power. They actually reject the power. Why? Because they don't have data that they are working with, data that will, will tell them the, the demand, the estimated demand for power within their areas of operation, so that they will now know exactly how much power they can take from the transmission company of Nigeria. Because they don't have that data, they just reject this power. And you know, I tell people that anywhere in Nigeria where you see a generator, from the, I better pass my neighbor, to the 500 kVA, where you see someone doing their solar system, inverter system, and things like that, it is because they didn't see public power to buy. That is why they went and they went on that expensive, independent way to generate their power. So if there are generators all over in Nigeria, meaning people are looking for power to buy, they can't buy it, and they are not generating it in a very expensive way, how can this cause now be saying we are rejecting power? We don't have the demand for power. It doesn't make sense at all. And that is just because they are not working with data they don't know what their demand is. They don't know where their peak period demands are. They don't, the people are stealing their power. They don't know anything, how to go about it and all of that. So the, the discourse, we know that the discourse licenses, all 11 of them okay. were issued to people who did not have the financial, technical, managerial expertise to run a power sector uh, distribution company. All like the telecoms. Uh, you see, the telecoms the privatization Ido, was very Ido, successful. You know, who kept uh, telecoms talking about was, meritocracy yes. and not a nepotism. But uh, sorry to cut you off, uh, Nicholas. We'd actually have to go on a quick break. But when we come back, I would allow you to uh, continue uh, your thoughts. And then uh, I will speak more on this. Stay with us. Welcome back and thank you for staying with us on the conversation. Now, just before the break, we we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, the uh, frequent grid collapse uh, in Nigeria and uh, the most recent one being uh, three grid collapses in one week. 
And we have two guests uh, with us, uh, two experts in that field, in the energy field, uh, to speak to us on this. We have Adebaya Dil, uh, sorry, uh, I beg your pardon. We have Idowu Oyebanjo, uh, MD, Aid Fund Power and Nigerian Consultants Limited. And we also have uh, Nicolas Agule, strategy consultant, you know, speaking to us on this. Now, just before the break, uh, uh, Nicholas, we are talking about how. You know, if uh, the government is actually to follow the uh, 2023 uh, Act, uh, that uh, it should be based on uh, merit and not, you know, on, uh, on nepotism. Because you talked about how most of the people who are actually run in the discos have no idea what they're doing. And you're about to say uh, something else. Please go ahead. So, uh, thank you very much. I was trying to compare the uh, largely successful telecom privatization vis-a-vis -vis the power sector privatization. And if you look at why telecoms were successful is that the telecoms licenses were issued to the MTNs, the Econet, the Etisalats, and so. These were already regional telecoms operators. They were in the business. They knew how to run this business. They had the financial capacity in other countries where they were operating that they could draw upon. They had the, the managerial capacity. They had the technical expertise. So immediately they got the telecoms licenses in Nigeria. They drew upon their resources globally, came to Nigeria, and improved telephone access from 500,000 lines, which NITE was giving us, to 220 million lines as of today. Just imagine the scale. Half a million under NITE, 220 million under these operators. Now, if you compare that to the power sector, especially the discos, there is no single disco that was in the power sector elsewhere before they got the licenses in Nigeria. One of them. We knew how they were incorporated in CAC, and the following day they went and grabbed these licenses. And they have sat on this sector without expanding it. When uh, NEPA, which was uh, later power holding company, was privatized, we were doing anything from five to seven thousand megawatts. And after we privatized, we went down to two thousand to three thousand to four thousand megawatts. What does that tell us? It tells us that these successful companies that came into the sector didn't put in much, because if they had put in much, like the telecoms, they put in over a hundred billion dollars into Nigeria. If the power sector successor companies also put in a hundred billion dollars or more into Nigeria, we would today be talking about 30,000 megawatts or 50,000 megawatts. And if that is the kind of power ad uh, output we have, then even the unit cost of providing that power will collapse because that's what happened in telecom. Do you remember before, if you, if you needed a not nine not number, you, you had to spend a hundred thousand naira plus 20 years ago over. Today, you can get a SIM card for free. But what is happening now, tragically, is that the Minister for Power, the National Electricity Regulatory Commission, all want to extract enough money from 3,000 megawatts, four or 5,000, which the minister is talking about now, to pay all the successor companies' costs. That is why the electricity tariff is very expensive, because they are trying to make this money from only three to 4,000 megawatts. If they were to make the money from 30, 40, or 50,000 megawatts, then at a fraction of the current cost, a fraction of the current tariff, the electricity companies will still be very, very rich. So uh, we just need to go back uh, uh, 11 years ago in 2013, whatever we did in that privatization needs to be redone. Okay. For transmission, uh, uh, government uh, uh, needs right. to all right, let's, privatize let's, it. Let's, let's also hear from uh, Ido. Ido, now, uh, I, I really want you to correct me if I'm wrong, because uh, I, I saw a report where it says that Nigeria actually su supplies Togo and Bene with 24-hour power. You know, I, I, I couldn't help but think of uh, how many Nigerians experience frequent outages. Now, aside, you know, uh, segments uh, or segmenting Nigerians into uh, Nigeria power into bands like band A to C or D, you know, um, are these segments actually working? I'm talking about band A, band B, band C. Are they working? And if they were to follow the 
2023 Electricity Act as well. What steps can the TCN take to prioritize and also ensure 24-hour electricity supply for Nigerian citizens, you know, matching the standard that we provide to our neighboring countries? Yeah, because of uh, historical reasons, Nigeria had to supply our neighbors. For example, because uh, it was agreed some decades back that some of these neighbors will not dam their rivers because if they, they did, Nigeria would not be able to get enough power from our hydro uh, generating station. But it was agreed back then that you will supply them. But uh, so we have to supply them. Even they owe us a lot, but we have to supply them. So you are right, we supply them. But because they are small nations with a minimum amount of power requirements, the, the, the little we are giving them will be enough to give them non-interrupted power supply or so more, more sustainable power supply. And that will generate income for Nigeria. But what that means is that because we didn't fix our own network, it's a very great alternative to push power to so that you can still have some money. Don't forget, uh, Nigeria has to pay some take or pay, take and pay, or I mean, take or pay uh, relationship with Azura, for example. So they have to look for where to sell power to get money to pay back. That's one on that issue. Um, on the issue of uh, what needs to be done with the Electricity Act, again, no need to put nepotism, no need to put quota system. Mm -hmm. Don't do lack of meritocracy. Mediocrity. You will, you will put meritocracy in implementing the Electricity Act. TCN was asked to be uh, unbundled. Unbundled from TSP, which is Transmission System Provider, the ones working with the wires and the transformers, and the system operator, the ones that we deal with the market and the system planning. And this body, Independent System Operator, is talking about that. This is going to be the only way that transmission system will be useful, aside from when you you decentralize using the Electricity Act. Now, in every state, they will also have their own independent system operator. And I think the best way is to make sure that it's only one uh, system operator we have in the whole of the country. I will come to that later in the future because that will be complex to explain in this arrangement. But I just, to put it, I just want to put it out there that in the real future of Nigeria, there will be only one system operator that will govern everything so that we don't look for money, we don't, look, uh, we don't do disorganized. But for now, implement the Electricity Act. Implement the policy number nine of the President Bala Ahmed Tiwa Ashiwaju Tinumbu. Uh, policy number nine says the President shall form a presidential tax force that will look after power. That tax force should do this, should be established quickly because they will now put the right people there who can drive the power sector and coordinate investments in the power sector to get us out of the doldrums. Okay. Now, um, we keep depending on, you know, energy storage and all that. But what about uh, renewable sources of energy? I'm still speaking with, you know, we'll come back to you, Nicholas. What about that, you know? Uh, it, it has been great gaining traction, you know, for a really, really long time. Uh, and I'm actually talking about uh, renewable uh, energy sources. Now, can you share your thoughts on integrating solar and also wind power into our grid? Absolutely. Um, is we are even behind schedule, honestly. Okay. Yes, solar uh, in the in the Western world is intermittent. They don't have enough uh, wind. It's not there. Uh, when it's there, it can be over much. It can break the blades and so on. But look, United Kingdom recently connected all the way from United Kingdom to the Sahara Desert in Africa. They pipe underground cable, submarine cables to collect the sun. Guess what? why? Because they realize that the sun in this part of Africa is constant, almost 100%. So that's what they need. So they spend the money to go and do it. But the people who are in the Africa, who have that sunlight, they never use it. The policy people, the people that are driving the Nigerian power policy did not write the, the uh, electricity policy and strategic implementation plan as required by the Electricity Act. Because inside that document should be written how they are going to harness the sun, the wind, the hydro in all parts of Nigeria, and we are waiting for that. 
So you will use that. The battery energy storage you talked about, fantastic system that you can be used to do many wonderful things in power system, which people don't know about because it takes those who have the uh, the fundamentals of power system to actually see what we can do with that. We leave that. We come to the other sources. What of waste? We generate a lot of waste in Nigeria, my God. So why can't we use waste to power for all these years? You will even employ people to pack the waste. In, in 2008, I sent a very detailed proposal to the government and some of the states. They didn't use it. You, you employ people to pick the waste in different bins. Take the ones that we use for power, we go and recycle it, burn it, use that energy to generate electricity. So you empower people, you provide electricity, almost free of charge. Which state of Nigeria does not have debts on the road? That's what you do. Landfill, biogas, biomass, all of these things are there that we can use. Mm. We have gas and oil in abundance. What you need to do is to send gas to gas power plants, okay. but make it in Naira. Don't sell it to them in dollars. We have been saying this one, I've been but, saying but, it since 2000. But what is the, the current you know, gas supply situation right now? Because it is priced in dollars, then the suppliers can't be paid back because our network is decrepit. It's not good. The network is weak. So they can't get their money back when they supply the electricity. So they hold back. But what solution I gave them in 2020, 2021, is that they should change that thing to Naira, the cost of the gas. Let it be in Naira so that Forex and what have you will not affect it. Then they should do an end-to-end solution to the network because if you pass electricity to a dilapidated network you are only throwing it into it's like putting water in a basket nothing will come out of it and you have wasted the entire water that's why the people don't want to supply if they cannot be paid back the way to do it is to listen to the committee report which i was a, a member and i we submitted it to former minister of power and i think we've shared it with the current minister that this is how you are going to solve the gas to power problem. And I was a member of that committee and we did a very brilliant work because a brilliant set of people were selected by the former minister of power to deliver that assignment. And we really did. If they go and pick up that document and follow everything we said there, Nigeria will start to have a proper feeling of electricity going forward. Okay. Now let's hear from Nicholas. Now, speaking of uh, gas supply shortages, energy storage, and uh, renewable energy sources, uh, can you model the potential effect on Nigeria's grid if we invest heavily in uh, renewables, in these renewables? You know, before I talk about renewables, uh, let me just speak briefly on gas. Because that is one of the areas where Nigeria comes up very badly in the eyes of the international community. Because how can we explain a situation where, as we speak today, a huge chunk of associated gas, that is gas that is produced with crude oil in Nigeria, is fled? So if you go to the Niger Delta now, as we speak, you have these perpetual fires. They burn 24-7. Mm. That is gas that came with crude oil. And the oil company simply separated the gas, uh, exported the crude oil, and just set the gas on fire, as if the gas has no value, you know? And then we are now talking about power stations, thermal power stations, complaining that, oh, oh, gas is an issue. And then they are now selling this gas to them in dollars, as uh, my co-panelist, uh, uh, Mr. Idowu is saying. This is areas where the government needs to have a rethink. The government needs to say, come on, why are we flaring this gas? Instead of flaring the gas, then why don't we offer the gas free of charge to the power stations? Because when you flare that gas, not only are we losing the value from that gas, we are damaging the environment. If you go to Port Harcourt and some of the Niger data, you have soot, soot falling on people, people breathing in. That is gas that is being flared all over the fields of Niger Delta, including, of course, the illegal refineries and all of that. All right? So you cannot be wasting a, a resource, and then when you finally channel the resource to a power station, you are now channeling it in dollars and transfer the dollar cost into the bills that Nigerians will be paying. So President Chinebu needs to say, look, we are going to have a, 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 a flare-out regime. And, and he agrees a timetable, a very firm timetable with oil operators in Nigeria to say, as so 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 time, is either if you produce gas, you must harness it, or you don't produce. 
and this problem will be solved. Imagine that even cooking gas that comes from this gas as well, that, that cooking gas that comes from this uh, LPG, that comes from this gas, it's also very expensive in Nigeria, you know. So now, uh, talking about renewables, renewables is the new way. That's the way to go. I remember that my time in Lagos, if you go to the bad beach, the kind of the force of wind that will be blowing on your face at the bad beach is such that all we need is to install wind turbines in the whole of the Atlantic Ocean at, at that bad beach area going towards uh, down, down, down uh, Calabar side. And as the wind is hitting these turbines, the turbines are turning and electrical energy is being, is being generated. And power can be supplied to Nigeria, just like my, my co-panelist said, far more cheaply than we, we talk about today. Now, if you go to the, to the nation of Qatar, Qatar is one of the nations that don't flare their gas. So they use their gas for power generation. And do you know what? They supply electricity free of charge to Qatari citizens. Qatar, people can Google that and find it out. So. You know, with the renewables, there, there's no place in Nigeria. I have been to all the states in the southern part of Nigeria. All 17 states in southern Nigeria I have visited. And I have visited, visited more than 10 states in the northern part of Nigeria. And there is no community in Nigeria that you will have to walk more than a kilometer or two to see a flowing body of water. You need, simply need to do is that, damn it. Damn that flowing body of water. Once you dam it, what's going to come off? You are going to have irrigation for all year round agriculture, so you don't wait for rainfall. You are going to have a power supply, hydro. You are going to have pipe bone water. Yeah, you are going. You are going to have uh, fishing activities, and of course, you can build tourism around that site. Yeah. So imagine the governors, okay. and this is where the subnationals have to come into play. Mm. If each of the state governors that have ruled the thirty-six states said. Every year, I will dam one river. Every yeah, year, I will dam so one how, river. How can we attract more investors uh, to the power sector? You talked about, you know, multinationals coming in. So to attract investors into the power sector is transparency on the side of government. I can assure you that Nigeria with a population of 200 million people is a beautiful bride that will be quoted by any investor all over the world. But the investors, they, they, what they fear is risk such as uh, anti-money laundering risk, anti-bribery uh, uh, control risk, you know, all of the shenanigans that people in government do. So we just need transparency and, and honesty and, and a, 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 a purpose on the side of those who are controlling uh, the government machinery. Mm. And if they do that, investors will come in. Because they want to take advantage of the huge resources, natural resources in Nigeria, and the huge market that we have that is ready uh, here, uh, available, okay, not to okay, talk okay, about okay, the export potential. All right, let's 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 quickly hear from Ido in one minute. Uh, please go ahead, let's have your final thoughts and how you feel, uh, you know, that we can attract more investors. Also, if you can tell us, you know, or predict the likelihood of future grid collapses based on historical data and current trends for us. Right, um, for the investors to come to a, a country like Nigeria, the policies of the government have to be clear, they may have to be friendly, that's going to be possible if the presidency establishes a presidential task force on power that they have planned. And that committee should be put, uh, those who, are, who merit it, that is to say meritocracy is key. Mm. Um, that's one. On the matter of... Uh, uh, getting a... Uh, what was the other question, please? Okay, Sorry. so I talked about investors. I talked about, you know, predicting the uh, likelihood of future grid collapses. Okay, so future grid collapse. You see, as we move into the... move off the rainy season, during the rainy season, you have an opportunity for hydro power stations to generate electricity and everybody will be feeling the impact, okay? Mm -hmm. Let us start the, the dry season now. You start to see the constraints we have been talking about without any investment. So when you get into November, December, January, uh, February, this is when you are going to see the test 
of uh, the grid collapses and that's when you always have this uh, collapses so we are going to make a presentation the chartered institute of power engineers in nigeria cypen is the only body that can really assist because they have uh, qualified people who assist and we are putting up a presentation shortly that will explain what needs to be done by the nigerian government and if they follow then good health to the power sector okay well, thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak to us on this. Uh, we just finished speaking to Idowo Ibanjo, uh, MD, 8 Fund Power Engineering Consultants Limited, and we also spoke with Nicolas Agule, a strategy consultant. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening.